morning. Welcome to Forums That Matter, a community <laughs> service of the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Cleveland. I'm Jim Rich, a member of the Forum Committee. I'll be uh, moderating today's discussion, which has both remote and in-person audiences. Thank you for being in person. Our topic today is the Western Reserve Land Con Conservancy, a national leader in conservation. They have permanently protected almost 70,000 acres of land, helping to create and expand more than 200 public parks and, and preservatives. Alex Zeka, their chief conservation officer, will explain how they do it. We'll have Q&A from about 9.30 until 10. Marlene, who was here someplace, right back there, will uh, provide a mic for our in-person audience. We ask our virtual audience to put questions in the Q&A uh, box, which should appear on your computer. Please be sure phones are off or in air, uh, airplane mode so they don't uh, they don't interfere with the uh, microphones here. Uh, this program is is being recorded and will be available in a few days. Go to our website uucleveland.org and click click on the YouTube icon at the top of the page. It is now my pleasure to introduce. Our speaker, Alex Seka, who uh, joined the Western Reserve Land Conservancy in 2013 after working with the Nature Conservancy in Ohio. His, res his responsibilities for the land conservancies uh, include oversight of the uh, conservation team, which uh, Which over uh, over the and all conservation projects the team takes on. I'm looking forward to his remarks. Thanks for turning lights on. <laughs> <laughs> now I don't have to turn down my. That's <laughs> Alex. The floor is yours. You can take over here. Thank you, Mr. Rich. Good morning, everybody. How's that? How's everybody doing this morning? Good morning. Good morning. Good. Good. Mr. Rich makes me feel even older. Understood. <laughs> uh, give me one second here, and I'll get the screen shared. All right. I think we're good to go. Um, before I kind of jump into the presentation, um, just want you guys to get to kind of know me a little bit. Um, uh, as Mr. Rich said, I've been with the organization for about 10 years. Um, I grew up in Northeast Ohio, uh, actually in Asheville County, so about an hour east of here, very rural um, Ohio. I uh, just grew up kind of a country kid, loved to be outside, do anything I could to be outside, and uh, very fortunate for that upbringing because I think that led me to where I'm at today, which is with the Western Reserve Land Conservancy doing land conservation every single day. Um, I went to Kent State University um, for my undergrad and got a uh, biology degree. Uh, then I went on to SUNY Brockport, which is the State University of New York at Brockport, uh, just outside of Rochester, New York. And I got a master's degree in wetland ecology. Um, had a couple kind of uh, semi or temporary to semi permanent roles with both USGS and the Nature Conservancy for a couple years. Uh, many of us to get into the conservation field, you don't start with a full time position, you start with many. Kind of seasonal and temporary positions and that's how it worked for me as well and um, 2013 very fortunate to land at the western reserve land conservancy and i've uh, been there ever since so i'm going to get through hopefully about a 30 minute presentation here just really kind of an overview about what we do western reserve land conservancy our mission uh, what we've done and throughout the region and also give some examples of kind of how we do it what we do and uh, how we've had some impacts here locally that you may or may not be aware of so the vision of our organization is thriving, prosperous communities nourished by vibrant natural areas, working farms, and healthy cities. Our mission is to provide the, natural, the people of our region with the essential natural assets through land conservation and restoration. 
So I know that you know those are kind of our uh, go-to key phrases, but what does that really mean? So our organization was founded in about 1990, so we're approximately 30 years old. Uh, we really founded on natural areas preservation, so we were founded in the Sugar and Valley, east side, east side of Cleveland, um, to really preserve the natural spaces, water quality, forest, river corridors, things of that nature. Uh, over the years, we have diversified kind of our reach in terms of what we or what we preserve and our effect on the community. In the early 2000s, we launched an agricultural um, program where we work to preserve agricultural land throughout our region. Uh, I'll get into our urban revitalization efforts, and then also more recently, we've taken on some really large scale restoration projects. So let me give you an idea of kind of where we operate. Uh, we recently expanded our service area by about nine counties. Um, so everything in red here on the map is where we operate as an organization. So it's kind of the Northeast Ohio quadrant of Ohio. Um, and sometimes we actually work outside of these bounds, and I'll show you a slide here in a minute where a particular portion of our work, we have worked outside these bounds, but um, pretty large geographical area. And when you think about Northeast Ohio, I think many of us are very grateful if you enjoy the parks or enjoy being outside. We have a um, really diverse set of kind of uh, resources. You know, we have really nice farmland. We have high quality wetlands. We have Lake Erie. We have these really nice rivers. So the opportunities here in Northeast Ohio from a natural resource standpoint, I think are second to none really nationally. You think about all the things going on in the West and the South, and you hear about, you know, these water crises and these fires and all these things. And we're really lucky in Northeast Ohio that we really don't have natural disasters and we have water, we have natural resources that we can um, utilize for the benefit of our lives. And um, we're, I think we're just really lucky. But going back to this slide, just really quickly, I'd, I'd like you to think about driving uh, Interstate Route 90, as many of you know, kind of goes right through our service area from east to west. And just think about as you drive down Route 90, as you enter Ohio from Pennsylvania, you get into Asheville, Lake Counties, uh, Geauga Counties is pretty rural, right? There's a lot of wooded landscapes. There's still quite a bit of agriculture, but um, probably maybe a 50-50 mix um, in terms of wooded versus agriculture. And as you continue to go west, you obviously get into areas like Cuyahoga County, which have been um, more built out, more developed. There's not a lot of the natural resources left. We'll get into that more in a minute. Then as you exit um, Cleveland going west into Lorraine, Erie, Sandusky counties, it obviously becomes very predominantly agricultural use. And, you know, as agricultural resources are important for us because um, we do uh, rely on them for food, uh, quite uh, frankly, but they're important from a heritage standpoint and uh, for many of us as Ohioans as well that grew up in those types of communities. But the one thing that we as an organization, I think, try to look at a little differently is we don't just put ourselves in this um, um, tunnel vision and say that all the natural resources should be protected. You know, we should protect every acre that we can. Of course, we would love if we could do that, but the reality is there's millions of people that live within the service area. And particularly Cuyahoga County, that's where most of the people live, but some at Stark counties, there's a lot of people live in greater African Canton areas. So really our work depends on what we, what we think and what the people think of those regions or those communities really should be done. So our agricultural conservation easements aren't gonna work in Cuyahoga County. Quite frankly, there's not really any agricultural land to protect anymore, right? So our work kind of varies as we travel geographically throughout our service area. So um, I'm gonna go in a little bit of kind of why we do what we do. And this slide really illustrates well, I think why we think what we do is important and hopefully many others do as well. So a couple of the key things to um, see on this map. This is obviously a map of Cuyahoga County or an image of Cuyahoga County. And looking on the left, you see in 1948, the dark red identifies um, developed land, right? So the city of Cleveland proper is particularly, or is pretty much all red, uh, thankfully, uh, Cleveland Metro Parks were a pioneer in um, open space and green space conservation way back in the day and created the Emerald Necklace prior to that, which as many of you know still exists today and hopefully many of you utilize it today. Uh, and then we look to the right, 2002, so uh, approximately a 50 year time scale. And you look at the amount of developed land in Cuyahoga County, it essentially went from Cleveland to the entire county, right? So the couple of important things about this is once land is paved over developed, built on, it is very, very hard to go back. And I would argue that it's not really economically efficient to go back because it's so expensive to tear out all the concrete <laughs> and do all the soil work that's necessary. We run into these problems all the time when we're trying to plant trees in Cleveland as the soil is absolutely garbage. Um, so, you know, once it's developed, it's, it's very hard to go back, right? So um, that's just an important thing to learn as we kind of continue to do our work. 
But the most alarming thing about this slide um, is that in 1950, the population was 1.4 million, right? You guys see that at the top left? In 2000, the population is the same. Today, six years ago, the population has gone down. So this is a prime example of how urban sprawl happens. Um, we have less people in the Cuyahoga County now and absolutely zero natural resources left because the sprawl effect, people just kept sprawling away from the inner city um, because conditions weren't great and it was cheaper to move out. And this is the domino effect and the kind of the hopscotch effect that we see over and over and it's happened throughout the United States for um, a couple of millennia. So this is why we think our work's important, right? Because it isn't that it keeps happening. At some point there will be no natural resources, whether it's agricultural soils or high quality wetlands or river systems or park systems. Um, for the, for the benefit of the people. This is just another really quick example. Uh, this has happened in Geauga County, 1975. The red is residential land use. 2000, uh, Geauga County isn't as developed as Cuyahoga County, but you see the effect. Geauga County is adjacent to Cuyahoga County to the east. So the western extent of Geauga County is getting more developed. Obviously, this the natural progression of sprawl. And so we've done an incredible amount of work in Geauga County, thankfully. So we've kind of gotten ahead of the curve here, but the pressure is always there. And Farmland, I mentioned we do farmland conservation. Farmland is typically the first kind of land to get converted. Why is that? Because it's ready, it, it's ready to be developed. It's cleared, there's no trees typically, it's level, it's well-drained. And so if developers are trying to figure out what property to go buy to develop, farmland is typically the one, the type of land that they uh, go after. Um, but as I said, agriculture is important for a lot of reasons in Northeast Ohio. From an economic standpoint, it's the number one or two industry in the state every single year. So it's a $105 billion industry. So from an economic standpoint, a lot of times people don't link conservation to economics. And I think this is a really great way that we can, is that by protecting the agricultural use, um, we are protecting an industry in Ohio, which is very important for, uh, you know, the, the cliche is no farms, no food, which is generally true unless you grow your own or uh, harvest your own. Um, but also um, jobs, economy, heritage, um, and so agriculture is important. We do a lot of agricultural preservation and 95% uh, of the farmland in Ohio is unprotected, which is kind of a scary thing when you think about uh, food security. Um, so this is something that we are prioritizing as an organization and we, we try to protect farms every day. Uh, so kind of how does this happen? How does this happen from a, um, I guess a financial standpoint or a community level standpoint? So this is a really great slide, um, cost of community services and these studies were duplicated and they were done by the uh, Center for Public Administration and Policy at Kent State and also the American Farmland Trust. They were duplicated in three communities in Northeast Ohio, so Geauga County, Lake County, and Portage County. So what they're looking at is kind of the cost of community service, services per land use type in a given community. And so the cost it is to maintain that land use type, but also the revenue that land use type generates per um, uh, essentially property tax income. So First thing you'll see here is that um, agricultural land use is kind of a net positive in terms of income generated in a community. So um, for every tax dollar raised for agricultural land use types, that's um, if, if um, communities paying taxes on 100% farmland, all they have in the community is farmland. For every $1 of tax revenue raised, it costs 37 cents to take care of that land use type, right? So if you think about very massive agricultural communities, they don't have a lot of kids, so you don't need big schools. They don't have a lot of infrastructure, so you don't need water, sewer. You don't need a lot of police because there's not a lot of people. Fire on down the line, right? So we kind of understand that that's not possible everywhere because we need other things than just farmland to survive. But the point here is that from a financial standpoint, it could create sustainable communities from a tax revenue standpoint, the way that things are set up here in Ohio. The next point is that oftentimes you'll hear, you'll hear in certain communities that uh, we need to build or we need to develop our communities because we generate more tax revenue for our communities by building houses and putting these developments and bringing people to our communities and building strip malls and this and that. It's not necessarily untrue, but it is not the whole story. So by building residential communities, you do bring more tax revenue if you're comparing it to what you had previously. Uh, but the reality is for every tax dollar raised for residential land use, it actually costs more to maintain than they're actually getting in tax revenue. So in this, you see here in these examples, it costs 34 cents or 40 cents, or 58 cents more than the actual dollar they're raising per that land use type. So 
you can get to see how this um, hot hopscotch effect takes place through Cuyahoga County and Yard County because people are always moving out because essentially it is cheaper, right? Because people move to Western Geauga County, very desirable place to live. All of a sudden you see levies, signs for levy support, signs for police support, signs for fire support. Taxes start to go up. People that lived, moved there 20 years ago because it was a quiet country neighborhood and the taxes were low can no longer afford it. So they keep pushing out, 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 out until they get to a place that it's uh, affordable and something that they, they desire. So from economic, from a macroeconomic standpoint, this is kind of how it happens. And I will say, um, just to fully explain the slide, and we're not obviously super pro-development, but we are pro-plan development, right? So industrial commercial land use is the best bang for your buck from a tax revenue standpoint. Now, should that be everywhere? No. Should it be on major interchanges, major state routes or highways? Yeah, probably should be there, right? If that's, if that's what your community decides, then that's a good... Um, and it's a good place for it, then that's a, it's a great way to produce tax revenue and um, have a sustainable community. Okay, so what do we do as an organization to kind of help create a better community here in uh, Northeast Ohio? So two primary things are urban revitalization and our traditional land trust, and I'll get into both of those here in a second. We'll first start with our Thriving Communities, which is a program that was founded uh, in 2011 with uh, former Cairo County Treasurer Jim Rokakis. Um, and a lot of people ask us, you know, your urban work, you don't protect land. They're right, we don't protect land. But the slides that I showed you previously, you, you see that we're kind of um, fighting off development all the time, right? We're working in these more rural communities, Geauga Lake, Lorraine, Ashtabula, Huron, because this world is just happening, it's becoming, it's moving away from Cleveland. So pre-2011, we're spending all our resources to kind of combat that urban sprawl. We said, hey, well, what if we take some resources and we put them back into the very urbanized areas like the city of Cleveland, where the infrastructure is at, primarily the jobs are at. Um, but we realized that the community was not in a place where people desired for that, right? It wasn't very healthy. So by investing some resources there, our, our central goal was to kind of redirect some of the development pressure out in the more rural counties back to the city of Cleveland, where, like I said, the housing is, the infrastructure is, the jobs are, travels quick, you don't have to drive an hour for employment. And so um, that's what we've essentially done. So some of the challenges in the urban um, arena for us have been um, predatory lending, loss of home, foreclosures, obviously many of you are aware, 2008 foreclosure crisis that created a really um, not healthy situation in the city of Cleveland and, and outside of the city of Cleveland and other places in Cuyahoga County, just created unhealthy places um, where a lot of this, um, the housing was close to jobs and things of that nature. So here's an example of share, essentially share of sales, uh, share of sales per square mile in 2000. Um, again, this is pre foreclosure crisis. There's not a lot, but there are some. Uh, again, this is in the year 2000. This is in the year 2010. So this is a cumulative effect of share of sales from 2000 to 2010. So obviously um, a lot of things happening, not for the good from an economic standpoint, people unable to kind of um, continue to pay their costs for their, for their housing. And this is what happens. So we formed Thriving Communities in 2011. Um, here's several kind of things that I'm gonna go into. Uh, we, one of the main purposes of land banks, I'll get into that more. Uh, property inventories we do as well. And I'll get into some of this um, a little bit more. So our land bank work, work is statewide, and I'll show you a map of this in a second, but uh, Jim Rokakis, uh, one of our, our former employees who really founded the Thriving Communities, uh, saw this as an opportunity to try and take control of these vacant and abandoned homes, right? The foreclosure crisis happened. We weren't going back from that. There was all these homes um, that were kind of in limbo, uh, owned by banks um, or other entities, and Land banks are a quasi-governmental entity that can take control of these properties that are vacant and abandoned, nobody's paying on them, and kind of clean the title. So it gives a, a new opportunity for this house or uh, vacant lot to become something else, right? The neighbor can either buy it and renovate it, or they can, um, the land bank can tear it down, it can become a garden space or a community gathering space, or whatever it might be. But these kind of land banks are really important to get control of these properties that are otherwise not producing any tax revenue, and, and a lot of times producing um, opportunities for crime and other things that just aren't healthy to the community. Um, obviously the land banks get control of it. So uh, we reduce these flipping uh, of properties from speculators uh, and it re 
eventually repurposes the property to something that is productive for the community and ideally back on a tax roll. So we've created 64 county land banks through Ohio. This map is not up to date. So if you count up those counties, there's, no, there's not 64. So please don't do that. Um, but uh, so we do this work statewide because we think it's very important not just to do this in our service area. And the way that we do this work is we literally just go to the community and help them set up the land bank. And then we walk away and they run it. So it's, it's just that initial step of getting them set up and on their feet and then, and then moving on to the next county. And obviously with the goal of getting a county land bank in every county in Ohio. Uh, another thing that our organization has done through driver communities um, over the last 10 years is we just do a tremendous amount of policy work. So you get this land bank in Cuyahoga County or Asheville County or Trumbull County, wherever it might be. That's great. That's wonderful. You get properties under control, but then what? You don't have any money. Typically, these communities don't have any money. So we did a tremendous amount of policy work at both state and federal level. And this slide is out of date as well. We've actually raised over a billion dollars for uh, demolition funds nationally uh, and in the state of Ohio. This money does not come through Western Reserve Land Conservancy. This is just lobbying the state and federal uh, legislators to get this money allocated to this purpose, uh, which is a big deal. It's not nearly enough money, but uh, it got those land banks that were kind of early in the game, have got control of hundreds, sometimes thousands of properties that then have funds to kind of prioritize where they were gonna demo properties where they weren't and um, figure out how to kind of best utilize their resources. Um, probably my favorite initiative of our thriving communities is our Reforest Our City initiative, um, mostly because of that picture of this young lady hugging a tree and uh, just giving folks the opportunity to get outside and maybe do something they wouldn't otherwise have the opportunity to do, uh, learn about nature, learn about trees, how to plant them, how to take care of them. Um, but, you know, Cleveland used to be known as the forest city um, for its forest canopy. Uh, now we're at like... 13% tree canopy, which is well below the national average. So we have a whole team of folks planting trees every day in the city of Cleveland and, and uh, farther to try to uh, restore that tree canopy. And that's important for a lot of different reasons, uh, water quality, air quality, um, human health, uh, mental health. Uh, there's just so many benefits of trees that we're not even aware of that. Um, so we're kind of fully invested in planting trees. Property surveys. So again, you get the land bank set up, maybe you get a couple, of, a couple of million dollars of demolition funds, but then what? How do you figure out where you should prioritize uh, where to spend the money? So we do property surveys. Uh, we essentially consult with these communities. We're doing this with the city of Cleveland right now, uh, where they hire us. Uh, we essentially hire a team to walk this, every street of the community, take a picture of the house with an iPad. They grade it from A to F. Um, obviously, then we, or not obviously, but we then create kind of GIS layer, kind of like a heat map of similar to what I showed before with the share of deed sales. And it kind of shows where there's a lot of vacancy and where there's a little vacancy. And so they can start to prioritize how they're gonna invest their funds, right? If there's one really, really bad vacant and abandoned home in a community where 20 people around it are doing, taking care of their house, you know, it's an A plus, they can obviously have a really big impact on that community by just getting rid of that one home. So they might take that one home down right away and then they'll focus on the areas where there's a lot more homes later. So it's just another tool that we provide uh, to the urban communities to, to uh, help them revitalize their neighborhoods. Okay, so now I'm gonna get into kind of our more traditional efforts um, and that's how we do conservation. I'll say the primary tool that we use to do conservation is known as a conservation easement. So what is that? Um, a conservation easement is a legal um, document that gets attached to the deed of a property that protects that property in perpetuity. How does that work? Well, it gets recorded at, every, at the county auditor for every single property. And um, we have interest in that property as the easement holder. So we have to monitor the terms of that conservation easement every year from now until perpetuity. So that is the document. That is how conservation actually happens in our world. Sometimes we own property, sometimes parks own property, sometimes we buy property, sometimes we sell property. Every single time a conservation easement goes on, depending, regardless of the transaction type, and that's how property is actually protected. Uh, conservation easements, we do a lot of private land conservation easements where we'll just work with, you know, um, a farmer out in Trumbull County who's a fifth generation farmer and the last thing they want to see is their farm developed, right? So they call us and say, hey, I want to protect my farm. How do we do it? We go through the whole process with them. We get the easement recorded, the properties. They still own it. They can still farm it. They can still use it. Uh, they can still live on it. Uh, they can still retain building rights on it. Uh, but that farm is essentially protected from development in the future. Uh, a lot of people think our conservation easements allow public access. They do when it becomes a public park, 
where private land conservation easements do not allow public access whatsoever. The land is still privately owned. The private landowner decides who gets to go on and who doesn't. Um, there are tax benefits um, for landowners that voluntarily put conservation easements on their land. Um, sometimes there are funds available to purchase conservation easements on land. Typically, we're looking at 30 acres or larger for a conservation easement. It's kind of a threshold we just decided as an organization that had a good uh, um, value and was efficient for the amount of work that we have to put into the situation as well. Uh, here's a good example of a conservation easement we did in Trumbull County. So we kind of create terms. We've done over 800 conservation easement easements. Every conservation easement of those 800 is different from the next. Not a single one of them. Now, the nuts and the bolts of them are very similar, but we really tailor them to the landowner because we want this to be a happy kind of marriage between us and the landowner. Because if nobody's happy at the beginning, nobody's going to be happy at any point in the um, relationship. So here you see on the screen a conservation easement. This was about 35 acres. Uh, the green area is, is conserved as natural areas, so that's really hands off. You can have trails and things like that, but you can't really do much else. You can't cut the forest down. You can't turn it into agriculture. Uh, the, the yellow area is uh, really what we call like a limited management area. So in this particular area, the, the landowner wanted to do some like prairie pollinator plantings and things like that. A little more active management of the property in the yellow area. And then the red or the purple uh, is an existing building envelope. So many times, we protect easements that have houses on them and people want to retain rights around the house. They want to mow the yards. They might want to put up new buildings, this, that, the other. So in that purple area, that landowner can essentially do whatever they want. So they can continue to mow it. They can put up more outbuildings, but everything else is conserved. And by the way, this property will always be one. It can't be subdivided in any form or fashion going forward in the future. So this is kind of a real life example of how we would do a conservation easement with a private landowner. Uh, here's an example of a landowner we worked with in Stark County. Uh, so he actually sold a conservation easement for agricultural purposes. Um, we do have some funds available to buy easements for agricultural purposes once in a while, but um, they don't go very far. But uh, Mr. Brailer uh, was very happy with the outcome and really great farm in Stark County. Um, so you hear mostly about our land acquisition work, I think, uh, generally. And we do a lot of this. So um, we kind of help other either public or nonprofit or partner entities buy land for green space purposes, right? So a community might come to us and say, hey, Land Conservancy, there's a 50 acres, it's next to an existing park. We'd really love to buy it. We have no resources, we have no capital, we can't put anything into this. Can you guys help us buy it? And we say, absolutely. We'll try to figure it out. Uh, that's kind of our value add to all the communities we work in. So we try to fundraise, we get the property under contract with the seller, we fundraise through grants, private, philanthropic, corporate. We go to them all and uh, try to figure out how to raise the funding to buy the property. A lot of times they become public access, public access parks, which um, I'll show you a couple of examples of. Sometimes they don't. Uh, we also, we have a conservation buyer program where we buy and sell property, um, conservation property, and uh, we put a conservation easement on the transfer. So we're satisfying our mission of conserving the property, but it's a really unique way to leverage private money. So just somebody that's looking to buy a property for recreational purposes, but still get conservation done. Uh, here's some funding sources. Um, I'll breeze through that because we're uh, running out of time here, but um, good example of a property that will become a public park. Um, I don't know, I would guess in the next five years. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with the city of Menor. So going right through the middle of the map there is Interstate Route 90, which I'm sure many of you traveled down many times. Uh, I'm familiar with the intersection of 615 and 90, which is just to the left of um, the property identified in red. So we just acquired this property last year. Uh, it's about 80 acres in the city of Menor. Um, one of my favorite projects that uh, we've ever worked on. So you see everything around this map. Uh, and if you know Mentor well, you know Mentor is very developed. Um, there's not a lot of natural resources left in Mentor. Uh, and it's amazing that this one was and that we had an opportunity to, to buy this property and it's permanently protected uh, at this point in time. Um, so we bought it, the, the Land Conservancy bought it, we currently own it. Uh, we are going to operate this as one of our signature parks. Uh, so we don't um, endeavor to be a park district, but there's some opportunities that are so good. Like this one, if you think about how many people can walk to this property in the future, there are hundreds, potentially thousands of people that can walk to this park. And uh, we were, just, were not able to connect with a partner that was willing to own this. So we said, well, maybe we should own this. Uh, and that's the position we took. It's going to take us a while to really develop it and do a park, so have parking and things like that, but we'll get there eventually. 
Um, really high quality wetlands on the site. So again, Menor's been very developed. It's amazing to find these kind of rural pool wetlands on the site, but they're there. Um, but the coolest thing about this property, uh, and again, I've seen hundreds, thousands of properties um, in my um, tenure at the Land Conservancy. It's one of the best parts of the job is just being able to see some really cool places. And if you were to tell me, where is the place that you would find three of the biggest tree species, three of the five biggest tree species in the state of Ohio, what county would it be? Or what community would it be? I would have never, never guessed Mentor. So on this property, there's two tulip poplars that are top five biggest tulip poplars in the state of Ohio, the number third and the number fifth. This is the number third tulip poplar in the state of Ohio. This tree is absolutely enormous. Um, <coughs> It's amazing to see, like when you walk, and these pictures do it zero justice. When you walk up to it, it's just unbelievable how large it is. Uh, what's also crazy, it's on top of a beach ridge. So the Whittlesey Beach Ridge, where this tree exists, was a proglacial beach ridge of Lake Erie 10,000 years ago. Don't quote me on the 10,000, but somewhere around 10,000 years ago. So Lake Erie used to be right, this, is, this tree was on the edge of Lake Erie 10,000 years ago. Lake Erie, of course, has moved, gone back and forth with the glacial advances. So this beach ridge exists because of that lake of Lake Erie being here at one point in time. You would think a tree this big with this much stature on top of a beach ridge, which by the way is made of sand, um, would topple over. But all three of those species that I explained all exist on top of the beach ridge for whatever reason. So the number five biggest sugar maple in the state of Ohio is a stone's throw from this tree, which is just insane. So that's just a good example of a uh, property that's pretty close to here that um, it would have been developed absolutely positively. Uh, as, you, as you know, a mentor, um, they're looking for economic growth and kind of any way they can. And I'm not blaming them. I'm just saying that's what's happened. And uh, we had an opportunity to protect an absolutely pristine natural resource. And we did that. And uh, someday it'll be open to the to general public. Another example here close to Cleveland is in Old Brooklyn. Um, so this was actually a construction landfill. So this project was um, quite the challenge for us as an organization because it has those environmental questions and liabilities when we took it on and we were able to navigate those, albeit it took a lot of time and a lot of resources. But you see this site um, next to a lot of people. Old Brooklyn is one of the most highly developed communities in Ohio. And um, this is, I don't know, 40 or 60 acres um next to cleveland metro park zoo next to a couple of trails so we if you just keep keep this in mind this is what it looks like today um so we put trails in uh connected to the zoo uh, people it's connected kind of two different entrances to the community uh we own this uh we are in partnership with cleveland metro parks who helps us manage this but a uh, really great example of taking something that was um i don't know about our new threat threat of development because everybody was scared of the demolition and environmental liability but Certainly it was going to be turned into something else at some point in time. Uh, here, here's what it looks like today. Uh, here's a sign, a couple of our staff members that, that worked their butts off to get the project done. Uh, and then I think the last example of a property kind of at rest of development that we just recently um, preserved. This is again on Route 90, so just east of the property I showed you previously. Uh, this is a very large property, 350 acres. So we actually bought this property at auction. Um, but before I get there, you see on the map, all the green is protected property, primarily owned by Lake Metro Park. So from a conservation standpoint, this is like an absolute no brainer, right? This is a puzzle piece that we want to get over a mile of frontage on the Grand River. This is kind of the project we look for every day. Uh, property went up for auction as part of a um, bankruptcy. And um, this property was going to be clear cut, uh, huge trees in the property. And uh, we spent a lot more money than we wanted to um, to get it secured. So we did what was called, we went at risk. So we bought the property and then figured out how to pay for it on the back end, which is risky because you never know if you're going to figure it out or not. Um, but the price was driven up um, to 2.7 million, which we thought it was going to go for between one and two. Um, but the primary reason because it was of the timber. There was some really large red oaks on the property and um, the, pe the person that we were competing against was going to uh, kind of slash and burn and then eventually they were going to develop it after they took the trees away. Um, but you see here's the property completely forested along the Grand River, um, sandwiched between Lake Metro Park's properties. Beautiful waterfall on the property. Um, so not just had awesome tree resources, but really cool water resources as well. Here's a view looking over the Grand River Gorge, kind of up high. There's a very steep drop off of the property. Um, 
quickly so I give you guys some time for questions. Uh, this is a really cool example of community conservation in a very rural agricultural community. So everything in yellow are conservation easements that we hold. The green is a state wildlife area. So we've protected about 10 or 12,000 acres of agricultural land. This is in northern and Trumbull County, southern Asheville County. The watershed you see there is Palmertuning Creek. Uh, so some landowners in this area have really bought into our work. This is all private conservation um, and um, very focused on agricultural preservation, which has, it's amazing to see that. And that happened in 10 years. Like this didn't happen over the course of 30 years. This has happened really quickly. And it's, it's really because the community bought in. Uh, and then lastly, um, we also get engaged in habitat restoration projects. This is one of my favorite that I like to share with people. So this is in uh, Northern Trumbull County, the Southern Asheville County, the property we own called Sugar Island Preserve. Uh, so you just notice to the right of uh, that ditch, you know, you see the habitat is nothing really um, to look at. It's kind of rough. Uh, it was previously farmed, uh, was previously mined for peat uh, and just really kind of beat up over the last hundred years. Uh, but wanted to be wet. This is a very wet area. So we took it from what you see there today, invested about three and a half million dollars and turned it into what you see now. Uh, uh oh. There you go. So I really killed the drama. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know what's happening, but that's all right. We're pretty much at the end. So anyway, um, we restored uh, 300 acres of wetlands, obviously important for water quality, for habitat, for all kinds of reasons, uh, migratory birds. Uh, really cool project uh, that took um, several years, but another thing that we get involved with as an organization. Uh, again, here's all the projects. You can't see it that we've done. Everything, every yellow dot is a property we've been served. Uh, we created over 200 public parks, 60, over 16,000 acres of publicly accessible land. Almost 300 working farms. Uh, you see at the bottom, we protected over 70,000 acres. We just reached that milestone last winter. Um, and almost exactly half of that is agriculture. And we didn't start doing agriculture preservation until about 2005. So 15 years, we protected 35,000 acres of farmland, which is, I always think, very amazing. Um, over uh, um, 870 total properties have been conserved. Uh, what can you do? Um, Check us out, volunteer, donate, support our mission. Uh, we greatly appreciate any support you're able to provide. Uh, tell your neighbor about us, tell any landowners about us. Uh, at the end of the day, it's really about the two pictures at the bottom, I think, it's the next generation. Our kids, our grandkids, are kind of leaving the place better than we found it uh, and trying to protect as much uh, open space and natural resource land that we can so that Northeast Ohio is a great place to live in the future. Thank you. I don't want to see me. Okay. Thank you, Alex, for an excellent preservation of what the Land Conservancy does. And I, without saying what you do to help it, uh, we now have we now have some time for uh, short questions. Uh, Marlene will have a speaker. We'll have a microphone for uh, people who want to ask a short question. Uh, for the people on the virtual, they may uh, go to the chat box and uh, usually Q and A box. Q and A box. Will uh, uh, Gene will be picking up uh, questions from there. Marlene, thank you. You know, if you drive up and down Cleveland, forgetting housing, there's so many brown fields. Oh, many brown fields. They've been dilapidated since I've lived in Cleveland for 40 years. And they're more dilapidated and they're prominent. You drive past Bessemer and it's block after block of unused industry, new opportunity Carter, 55th and Euclid. Plants that are not being torn down, maybe worthless. Can they be used for orchards or trees, or are they just too toxic to ever use again? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, you know, it's really like case by case basis in terms of what they should be best repurposed for. I mean, from a green space standpoint, they take a lot of money, a lot of resources that um, 
the property that shows you in old Brooklyn, you know, that was a demolition landfill. That was essentially a brownfield and we were able to repurpose that into a public park, but that might not work out every time. Um, but uh, there is a lot of funding being funneled into brownfield demolition at the state level uh, as of recently. So um, we hope that, that a lot of that's able to be repurposed in the future for sure. I mean, is the soil just gone? You can't use it for anything? And he's very disturbed. I mean, even when we work in areas that aren't technically brown, brownfields, more residential areas where we're doing tree plantings. I mean, when you're digging with a shovel, you're hitting bricks, you're finding things that um, aren't great habitat for tree roots. So it is a challenge and it, it's costly, which is part of the problem that a lot of it hasn't been repurposed. I really appreciate this conversation today. I am an individual landowner. In addition to volunteering, which at my stage of life, it's kind of hard for me to get out there other than my, my own yard, and that's what I'm asking about. In addition to volunteering and donating monies, what can we as individual property owners do? Um, I mean, there's a lot of things you can do. I mean, from a from a land conservancy standpoint, I guess I would just say being aware of us, but also it, like if you want to improve your property, there's a lot of programs out there for like pollinator species. You know, it depends what re you really are into and what you really want to support. But there are a lot of different things that you could do on a half acre that support nature that you know aren't necessarily things that are what we do every day. But there's a lot of things out there that you can do. Um, and I would just say, um, reach out to your local uh, soil and water conservation districts. They can be very helpful in terms of providing you options for like sometimes what's known as backyard conservation um, and things like that. Tom Gibson. Be, before uh, you were taking farms, we put our farm into Ohio preserved farmland. And I was wondering how do you work with the state of Ohio and maybe other places that preserve land like the Cleveland Museum of Natural History? How do we preserve land? Like how do you work with them? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, we work with everybody. Um, so we work to clean the Museum of Natural History every day. Um, so we've partnered on tons of projects. We hold easements on a ton of the property that they own. So um, holding easements, so owning land is kind of one way to protect land, but holding an easement is like an additional layer of protection. So, you know, we often say nonprofit boards change, political climates change. You can never really know what's going to happen in the future. And so, uh, in the museum's case, like they own the property, but then they put an easement on it with us. So there's two layers of protection there. Um, but in terms of our partnership with other entities, you know, we've done projects with Lake Metro Parks, Asheville Metro Parks, Cleveland Metro Parks, every Metro Park within our service area. So we help buy the properties, transfer them over to them, typically at little or no cost. We put a conservation easement on it, which guarantees that it's preserved, but then they own it, utilize it for open space for whatever purposes they think is appropriate. A farm that is put into these easement programs, mm -hmm. it passes from the owner to the next generation. Mm -hmm. Is there any possibility that generations down the road could say we no longer want this easement? No. The only way an easement can be terminated is through judicial proceedings. So, uh, or eminent domain. And typically, eminent domain doesn't take a whole farm. Uh, so we learned this um, when the Nexus pipeline went through. How many of you remember about? A little less than 10 years ago or right around 10 years ago um when that when a pipeline comes through and they have the ability or the power of eminent domain they typically just take the corridor so you got a 100 acre farm and the pipeline's going to go through it eminent domain only takes the portion that the pipeline impacts in turn so that's one way um the only other way that an easement can be terminated is through judicial proceedings so a judge would have to rule that the conservation purposes are no longer achievable so that's hard to fathom what that means but let's say uh, you got a hundred acre farm and uh, it's all corn and beans or whatever it might be, but it's all farmland and some crazy event happens and all the soil is gone. All the soil washes away, let's just say, and it's just clay. And you literally can't uphold those conservation purposes because you can't grow anything there anymore. Then these that could, a judge could probably rule, we can't, you, we can, you can't enforce this easement because the conservation values are gone and it could go away. But that's a very, uh, an example that's not going to happen, most likely. I have a couple of outline questions. 
Um, two of them I'll sort of combine. They have to do with Euclid Creek Park and the trailer controversy. Um, one person says, some of the trailers are in horrible shape, but many are lovingly maintained. The greater public and the wildlife will be gained by moving these people out. But what is your responsibility to help them find new homes? Or can some of them stay? Could you make a few new small eco homes available, replacing the trailers for the good tenants and maintain them as subsidized low income housing and maybe support a grocery store? Yeah, unfortunately, I can't answer that question. I have not been involved in that transaction. Um, many of my colleagues have, but they should reach out to um, my colleagues uh, um, that work in the Toronto Community's Office and answer those questions. Hi, thank you very much for your presentation today. I'm actually I'm a tree steward. It's one of my very favorite thank things. Thank you. Yeah, I love doing it. Um, I'm just wondering, do you guys get involved in any of like advocacy or lobbying or anything like that at the at the state level? We do. Uh, I think probably more than uh, people are aware of. So we actually have a director of public policy on our staff, um, and it's his sole job to lobby at the state and federal level. He's going to be going to Washington, D.C. a couple of times this spring. Uh, goes down to Columbus often. We meet with all of our legislators as often as we can. Um, it's an important part of the work to kind of create change from a higher level that then typically funnels, funnels down to a funding, some type of funding avenue. So uh, yes, we get very involved in that and we try to be very active in that. Hi, thanks for a great presentation. So following up on the previous question, what type of, what are your policy goals and could you give us some examples of policy initiatives that you would like to see enacted into um, legislation? However, of course, that's unlikely given the sort of makeup of the state legislature, but uh, so, uh, maybe a couple examples. Sure. Um, I think the best and most recent example is the H2 Ohio initiative that uh, Governor DeWine put into place. Um, so that's it's probably been five years, maybe. Uh, so we helped lobby the state government um, to support that. So it's, I don't, don't quote me on the numbers, but it's like 50 million a year to Ohio for conservation projects, essentially. It's really uh, focused on water quality initiatives uh, related to Lake Erie, but it's expanded to all of Ohio. So we are, um, we help lobby that when it's kind of becoming a, or gaining traction or gaining, gaining momentum from a state policy level. Um, one thing that we're always lobbying for is more money for conservation, whether it's H2 Ohio or the Clean Ohio Conservation Fund or the EPA's Water Resource and Restoration Sponsorship Program or North American Wetlands Conservation Act, uh, the Farm Bill. Um, we're always lobbying all of them for more money and all, all the time, but we're also lobbying for like flexibilities for um, practical usage of the programs. Like the Farm Bill, good example of the Farm Bill work that we've tried, and I don't know that we've succeeded at uh, to date is many of you know, but Northeast Ohio um, was highly developed by oil and gas wells in the 60s and 70s. They call them the Clinton wells because they're shallow, typically gas producing wells. And so when we do easements on property, we have to explore and research the chain of title, which is everything that's ever happened on the property since the beginning of time, more or less. And um, almost, I would say 99% of properties in our service area have some type of oil and gas lease on them already, right? So we made a strategic decision a long time ago that we're really going to have to figure out how to work with them or we're not going to do any work. Um, so we figured out how to do work with them. So trying to navigate the language around like oil and gas policy related to the farm bill programs is difficult because that's a federal program and we have this little problem here in Northeast Ohio and that only means so much to them, right? Because they're working Wyoming, Florida, Texas, and it's a little bit different everywhere. So that's an example of some of the things we do. Thanks. Thank you, this has been great to hear. Um, my uh, topic has to do with working with kids in reforestation in the urban areas. I think you guys were involved with the Arbor Day stuff. And like I was at FDR a number of years ago when 
during Arbor Day, we involved the kids with uh, planting trees there. And the tree I was working with with kids that were like, what do you want to name your tree? Mm -hmm. Oh, it has so many branches. We're going to call it Branchy. And, you know, <laughs> yeah, that's the best just, part. I love that stuff. Um, and my question is, it seems like there would be a lot of work involved in maintaining those plantings to keep them watered so that till they're established, that kind of stuff. How do you manage all that? <laughs> Hmm, that's a great question. That is the biggest challenge, as you know, from being a tree steward. Maintenance. <laughs> tree steward. <laughs> planting them is easy, yeah. um, generally. Um, it's watering them, taking care of them, you know, training folks in the neighborhoods that can take care of them. And uh, as I said, the soil conditions don't help that, right? Um, so they need kind of more care than if you would go plant a tree in a perfectly virgin forest or something to that nature. Um, but uh, it's, it's all about education, outreach, and as you said, um, you know, not only this generation, but the next generation. And we've currently kind of doubled down on our outreach and education. Um, we hired uh, Renee Baranca, who used to work at Cleveland Museum of Natural History. She leads our outreach and education program now. So um, we, we're doing a lot of that work. Um, I was just wondering with regards to urban sprawl, in order to keep the city more attractive for people to live and it's important for historic preservation, do you do any work with that? If you see a property that's got something hmm. valuable and try to save that building? That's a great question. Now we have. And one thing I guess I wanted to mention um, in my presentation that I forgot is that um, related to like the thriving communities and reinvesting in Cleveland and Calgary County and the place where people should live, you know, prior to COVID, and I think many of you might agree with us, prior to COVID, the movement of younger folks to Cleveland was really happening. Like, a lot of people were desiring to live down there because of the things that can be you, you can access and do. And then COVID happened and it was like everything turned around. I was like, we gotta get away from the people. Um, I hope that it kind of switches back to that um, just from a kind of um, fending off urban sprawl standpoint. But um, I forgot your question now, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, but yes, so we have. Uh, we don't do it often, but we have. Uh, we've done it in Hunting Valley. We've done it in Chagrin Falls. We've done it in um, Wayne County. We actually bought and restored uh, Keister Mill, which is a historic water mill, um, one of the most historic in the nation because it operated four different types of um, kind of manufacturing processes. But it's not the bread and butter of our work, and it's almost always attached to some type of land piece. Right, like every one of those that I just uh, said had a land piece with it, so they were kind of a combination. We're not, um, you know, we're not going to do every historic preservation project you see, but some that makes sense that we'll do. But I agree, it's important for sure. I have another online question Do you work with farms which you are helping to use regenerating methods? Uh, we don't, we don't do that, so our um our goal and our mission is to get the farmland protected right and 100 acres we want to protect 100 acres what the person does in 100 acres is really up to them so the reason we do that is because we think we can have the biggest reach with our conservation work by being flexible if we were to take a position on doing agriculture in a certain way we would stop doing a lot of acres of farmland i can guarantee it so we have a very fun challenge of navigating kind of all the political and ideological boundaries of uh, the communities we work in. And we try to just respect everything that everybody believes in and we try to protect land. We, we would support that type of activity on our protected land 100%, but we're not gonna force anybody to do it. Thank you again for a wonderful presentation. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Does anybody else have a question? Okay. Um, we, we've had forums here on the power of the oil and gas industry. It, they are extremely powerful. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that you had to work with those, those uh, scenarios with the, the deep, deep underground uh, mining uh, issues. Can you give me an example of how you have worked with them and also if there's a way that uh, legally or uh, any other way that uh, that power balance could be adjusted so that they didn't have as much power as they have 
Yeah. Yeah, I can't. I can't answer the power balance. I think that's above my pay grade um, for obvious reasons. Uh, in terms of how we worked with them, we have. Um, so examples are like uh, the Nexus situation. Um, and let's just not talk about, I guess, oil and gas companies, but power utility companies, for example, that are putting utility right away in. Um, we try to get ahead of the game, right? So they come out with these studies and say, hey, we're going to put this new power transmission line. This happened in Geauga County not very many years ago. Obviously, it happened with Nexus. We kind of take them a meeting and say, hey, we're a conservation entity. We got conservation easements here. Here's our GIS letter layers. You're not you're not allowed to put your um, utility line through our conservation easements. If they have another domain, they obviously know that they still can. But we say, let's try to figure out a better path that doesn't impact our conservation easements because that'll save us all a lot of time and money. Um, so we try to get ahead of the game. And we have. We did it in Geauga County. Um, the, there was a utility corridor that went parallel to 528 going north and south. And we, we worked with them to avoid going through our conservation easements. Thank you, Alex, and thanks to our audience. Um, right. Next week, our forum will be on Medicare free privatization and, will, and what private enterprise is doing to the system. It's entitled Medicare privatized, endangered, or re or reformed. Our speaker will be J.B. Silver of the Case Weatherhead School of Management and School of Medicine. I think that will be, I'm not sure it will help do this one, but I think it will be good. <laughs> no way. <laughs> <laughs> we'll bite on you anyway. Um, you're welcome to attend our 10 15 uh, Sunday service, either upstairs in the sanctuary or on uh, our YouTube page. Uh, the theme of our service today is what the world needs now. How our capacity in love to love meaningfully and sustainably interacts with the needs of the world around us. The service leader is our Reverend Randy Bartain, who always has good things to say. To see what else is happening in our congregation, check out our website on uucleveland.org. Do I have anything? It seems to me I had one other thing to say here. I think you're good. Lori Albright would like to make an announcement also. Okay. Yeah. Hey, Lori. Hi, everybody. Um, the uh, groups that represent interest in reproductive freedom and rights in Ohio are planning to put a constitutional amendment on the ballot this November. And the first phase of the project is to gather uh, at least a thousand. So we're going for 3000 signatures this weekend across Ohio to accompany the language that goes to the attorney general. If you would like to sign that petition, that's going to go on Tuesday down to the state. I have petitions over there and, and flyers and can tell you more about it. Thank you. One last comment. The forum committee, a bunch of us here, uh, is considering changing the season schedule to the first and third Sundays of each month. Uh, we normally had uh, three in a month, typically. But we want to cut back a little bit, but have a, a, a longer session. If you have a view on this, talk to us after the forum or email us at forums at uucleveland.org. We really would like to hear your comments. Thanks, everybody, for a, a great forum.